welcome to Silver Threads, where we are still walking, still waking. I'm one of your hosts, Carla Bergman. And I'm Eleanor. And this is the show where we trace our present path through the people and stories of the past, as we ourselves, long-term radicals, learn about each other, from each other, and continue to walk, continue to wake. This week, we are joined by Shanti Alston, an anarchist Panther elder, former member of the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, and a former political prisoner and longtime member of the Jericho Movement, an anarchist. Developed abolitionist politics in the early years of critical resistance, helped save the life of a baby pig with the animal liberationists, learned depth queer politics from being challenged, and non-ego eldership through loving the young and generations who truly want to carry it on. Presently, Ashanti is the board member of the National Jericho Movement and Center for Grassroots Organizing in Vermont. He lives in Rhode Island with Vivian, Biko, Yasmin, and Pup Appa. Thanks so much for joining us, Ashanti. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Ashante. It's just so thrilling to finally meet you. I've um, just have known you through other people um, through years at the Purple Thistle. Anytime we were talking about the intersection of kindness and being showing up badass and radical, Matt Hearn would say, oh, my bud, Ashante is the one. Matt Hearn. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I've always been like, who is this Ashante? <laughs> to meet him. <laughs> so it's just, I'm just so delighted to have you here. Um, so thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so our first question is uh, we ask our guests to help us kind of weave a, a story with their historical threads um, and take us on a little bit of a journey and maybe share some of your watershed moments of uh, how you got involved in organizing and radical movements. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I'm uh, I'm from Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, also, next next week I'll be 67. Um, I came up through the 60s, so that was my period. Um, my teen my teen years, and it was all in the height of um, civil rights movement, uh, the Black Power movement, the anti war movement. Uh, there was so much going on that, you know, at the time you could turn on the television um, and see every day there's protests, demonstrations, something going on. And even though, you know, I was I was young, uh, you know, you can't help but notice that there's all these demonstrations and there's all this uh, violence from the police, like of brutalizing people, arresting people, not just so much even arresting, but just viciously brutalizing people. And even at that age, I mean, you know, it's not right. Um, and, but then you also know that even in my hometown, which is small, um, there's a lot of racism in my hometown. I, black people tended to be in the West End of Plainfield um, and in certain pockets of the East, East End. Uh, but the racism was just so clear. Um, so when things started happening and the rebellion started jumping off in like uh, 66, 1966, 67 particularly, um, the rebellion hit Plainfield. And so for me, this is no longer the television. This is like looking out either your window or looking down the street and you're seeing things going on. And I understood it, but it was really different for me in the sense that though I seen police, not no, not even police at this point, this National Guard had taken over an intersection right down the street at the corner where the, there's a grocery store, there's you know different stores and everything, but we're watching and they're harassing every black passenger or black car that goes by, like with black people driving. Other cars, they're just letting go, but they're making the black people get out of the cars, they're searching them. You know, we don't kind of know what the dialogue is, but it don't look pleasant. But it was, it was making my brothers, my older brother and his friends uh, quite angry to the point where they felt like they needed to do some things. So people was kind of ground, grounded around 
crowded around our house. Um, and then at a certain point, they took off, my brother and his crew. And I don't know what they did, but I, I think that they went, they felt like they needed to do something in resistance to what was going on on the corner. Where us younger ones, you know, like we couldn't go nowhere. We had to stay home. We had to like watch or maybe throw a rock or two. Um, but that was our part. We felt like we're participating in this. We're fighting back with the older folks and, and others and what the police and the government is doing. Maybe a day or two passed and People were still milling around outside because people were always, you know, at this time, community really, there was still a sense of community where people gather around, they talk, they joke, they play, drink coffee, you know, all that stuff, but still talking about what's going on. This black car comes. Black, black people are driving the car, but it's this shiny black car, it looked brand new, but on the top of it was written, Black Power. And I'm like, wow. You know, I am, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, it gets me. And, and we had already had a sense of this black power thing because there was times we hear on the news, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rat Brown, or people from the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was SNCC. And he was more militant than the, the general civil rights movement, Martin Luther King and, and the rest. Um, they were talking about what Black people needed to do for themselves. So to see Black power on this car, I wanted to know, like, how can I be a part of things like that that was inspiring me and the people who was also watching? I wanted to be a part of something that was that bold. So maybe days later, we know that, that there was folks in the community that were still kind of holding the community because they had guns. Uh, but then when the, uh, when, the, um, when the National Guard and I think maybe sections of the army came in, they, they was able to um, suppress the rebellion. So after that, though, it's like, I want to know more. So I searched, like right down the street at the community center, I found out that they was having talks and discussions. And that's where I want to go. And I feel like it was at that point that was my entry into the struggle or what we saw as the Black Revolution. And from that point on, it's like I was reading everything I could get my hands on, on Black history, on uh, um, certain authors like W.E.B. Du Bois. And I was not a reader. I was not that type of person that even liked to read. You know, but now I want everything. I want to know more about this pride, you know, and, and these people who seem to be so articulate in, in, in the way that they express what was going on. So at that point, I'm like, I'm in. And by the time we started our next year in junior high school, there was others like myself. And we found ourselves trying to uh, emulate the black power folks. And because they didn't have black history in schools, junior high, high school, we realized that the high school students was going to do a walkout. And we decided to join them. And we all marched down to city hall and demanded black history. By that next school year, we had black history. So it was me also understanding the importance of unity coming together and the power of people coming together. And that for me was like everlasting, you know? So even to this day, I mean, I feel like I have not stopped. And I was at that point, like 13, 14 years old. But that would be my kind of watershed moment in, in, my, in my politics. One of the things that that is part of your bio where it says, you know, it just says anarchist, 
period. And I think that that's like a very powerful statement. And I'm curious like a, about that, that specific journey and, you know, how did we, how did you get from that, you know, kid watching that car pass by with black power on the, on, on the, on the top to anarchist period. Oh, that, that was a journey. Definitely. <laughs> because, um, because at that point I didn't know much about organizational structures I didn't know much about um, even the visionary aspects of like what what is black power for? What does freedom look like? We all know that we wanted an end to that racist treatment. And I think that we also had a sense that we wanted something more communal where like we in our own communities uh, would be not even in so much just in control but we would be a source of pride for each other, you know, after just, it just seemed like it was just yesterday that we never felt that we could do anything together, you know? And now there's this sense of blackness, there's this sense of unity, there's this reaching for um, um, historical uh, factors in Africa that showed that we had built, you know, kingdoms and civilizations uh, universities and all this other stuff way before the European slave trade disrupted all of that, you know. Um, so so it was the journey from Black Power to joining the Black Panther Party, where the Black Panther Party began to uh, allow me to have a more developed view on what freedom might look like, you know and ideas of socialism, communism, national liberation, terms like that started to come into play and, and studying these other movements and seeing how they operated. Um, and it was definitely clearer than those early days of, of black power, but still not a critique yet of the organizational structures. And that was, but it, I, I guess I had to go through that. You know, I had to go through this period of like seeing how people were still organizing under this uh, national liberation structures, even Marxist influence structures, Marxist Leninists, because we, when we learned about Mao Zedong and Kim Il sung, you know, and even reading, uh, you know, Lenin and uh, Karl Marx, you're going to get this understanding of structures but maybe not in the sense of are some structures uh, or do they carry certain inherent oppressions that you may not see and you just do the best you can in them. And maybe in the experience of these Marxist Leninist structures or national liberation structures, you sense that some things ain't quite right but you can't articulate it. So for example, in the Black Panther Party, you know, we're doing all this amazing work. We got survival programs going in Plainfield. Teenagers in our senior, no, junior year in high school going into our senior year. We had a uh, free lunch program, free clothing programs. We had an office uh, that where we was able to do our liberation uh, schools and stuff like that. And, Walk in the streets, you know, in, in the in the in the neighborhood that we was in, which is one of the uh, like the center of the black community where the rebellion uh, took off, uh, and we're doing this amazing work. You know, people were relating to people. We're having these conversations, debates, and you know, and it was all good. But then at a certain point, you in the Panther Party, you started hearing the things that the leadership are, are doing that don't make sense. It says that they're supposed to be this internal democracy, but then we find out that they're expelling people who at one point they had on a pedestal as this is the example of a panther, you know, serving other people. Next thing you know, this person has just been expelled. His picture's on the front of the, 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 the newspaper. And there were some who were like, the same right. And then there was chapters in New Jersey 
where we would go, uh, Jersey City, and the chapters were doing very bad in terms of uh, keeping their bills paid. They, they, a lot of times it was a house and the programs operated out of the house. But the relationship was supposed to be that the Central Committee, QEP Newton, Bobby Seale, and others, uh, from the sale of the newspapers would send back certain uh, percentages of the monies to, for the maintenance of the house and things like that. And it wasn't happening anymore. People began to question that. And when people questioned, they seemed to have uh, suffered from it. Now it a, becomes a bigger discussion. And, and like even as teenagers, like we're still new to this, but we're learning that no one is above criticism. If that's what we say, the older Panthers was like, no, nope, no one is above criticism, not even the leadership. And you see that it's coming to a point where there's paranoia starts to develop. And when it's obvious that leadership is not hearing anything, there's this letter that comes out from the Panther 21 that is openly criticizing the Panther leadership, UP Newton and all of them. And they put it out publicly because there was no other way to get it out because the leadership was not hearing anything anymore. They just wanted total acceptance, total obedience. So at this point, the split was developing and eventually the split happened. And it was really important for me as a young person, just understanding this stuff to have things explained to me that no one is above criticism, not even the leadership. You know, and even though UBP Newton is such an icon, icons are not above criticism either. So the split happens. And those and those of, of, of us on the East Coast and other places, not just the East Coast, but even there was chapters in California and other places too, decided that we're breaking off from that leadership and we're going to continue to be the Black Panther Party caused problems that led to some people getting hurt and killed. It was a, and it was really a rough time, but it was understood that these things happen in revolution. We've been studying, that's what we've been studying, these other revolutions, there's these internal contradictions. And But what are you going to do as an individual to stay principled? And the, those of us who we were close to, they was like, stay principled. So eventually the split happened and, and, and it's like the majority of the movement stayed with Huey. They supported Huey because Huey's the icon. We kept with our programs. We kept with the survival programs and others like that, but we also continued to develop that underground, which became the Black Liberation Army. For me, it was important to go through that because I wanted to be that person who stayed principal. I wanted to keep my eyes open and my understandings clear. Um, and it was great to have help, but it actually wasn't until it was, uh, that I had an opportunity to do other readings to help me understand why that split happened. Because it stays in your mind. But there's this wonderful organization, Vanguard, as we called ourselves, right? Want to be the leaders of this revolution that's going to change America. And then to have the split happen and things fall apart and understand that the counterintelligence program was in effect. It was doing this thing. But then in prison, sometimes that's the opportunity you need to be able to, to reflect and have per chance some different readings to help you. And that's when the anti-authoritarian readings come in. That's where the anarchistic, anarchistic readings come in, you know? And they, they allowed me to begin to look at that whole period through a different lens. So the anti-authoritarian was more like the critical theory. Marcuse, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Fromm and, um, and cats like that, right? And uh, 
that was helpful because it gave me a sense of the psychological dynamics that were going that go on as well when people are trying to change the world, never realizing that you internalize a lot of your oppressor and that the battle is not just against those outside structures, but the structures that has formed within you. And that for me was heady. I'm like, okay, so the egos come into play and the people's backgrounds come into play, but then the, the, you begin to understand your enemy also understands these dynamics and they're going to also play on them. Their job is to stay on top. Their job is to crush you. And if they can manipulate things amongst you where you end up crushing yourself, it's even more devastating to the community that you come out of because it makes it seem like, well, there you go. We could never come together. We cannot do anything. See, it's the old myth, you know, so it hurts. But if you can understand it from them different perspectives, the psychological, the radical psychologies, and then comes the anarchism to, that really critiques the structures as well, I'm like, man, there was a way out. There was ways, there was things that could have been done that maybe could have prevented that. And being that you can't go back in time, you can only go forward. So you want to make sure that your relations with people, your relation to the struggle carries those new insights that you're getting. So, but that was like from, uh, you figure we was in the other part of at least 1970, I didn't start getting that till we got captured in 74. And 74, 75, 76, it took, a, it took a while. It wasn't easy. It wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't uh, like a straight linear thing. You know, had to go through some things. But you had to also be willing when you see these insights, that you accept them for what you're seeing and not try to bamboozle yourself. Don't try to fool yourself. You know, you want to move forward. So there was comrades inside who were already kind of anti-authoritarian. And a few, two in particular, were definitely anarchists. And um, they, their literature I began to read. And it helped me to get clearer and clearer on what happens internally to revolutionary organizations that can derail their best intentions to move towards liberation, revolution, some kind of freedom away from the, the madness. So it was a process, but man, another one that since that time, Anti-authoritarian, anarchist, feminist, um, radical ecologies. It got to the point where with me and when the computer the internet comes, I just put radical, whatever I want to understand. Put radical on there, and then you are liable to get some anarchist tapes on something that, that begins to show you how you have to be aware of structures. You have to be aware of, of, of how hard it is sometimes to go beyond certain belief systems that you may not even realize can set you back. And that became important, stay open, read. And in the process of trying to organize and do things, work with people, your readings help you to become clearer and maybe to be able to develop more creative, successful practices. You know, and it's but that's a struggle, you know, and it's and it's gotta be accepted as a constant. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Shante, there's we call it silver threads because you know, I imagine all these threads mm. weaving into this beautiful tapestry, and you've just given us so many to pull from. Um I um first of all, I love that it was from that you said from and not such a, I mean, there's the love, oh my goodness, that you radiate. Um, you and, know what, if I can just interrupt you for a yeah. minute. Eric from this is this is that point, we're captured. We were uh, doing a, um, 
bank expropriation in New Haven, Connecticut, underground, and we're captured and we're facing trial. There was a, in New Haven, there was a support group. Um, actually, it was a Trotskyist support group, really good group. But a woman that was part of the support group one day gave my attorney a book for me to read, Art of Loving. I didn't know how to even take that. I'm like, is she flirting? I'm like, so I, I took the book, and you know, I know that after trial, they take you back to the jail, at whatever jail that they got you in. And I took it back. And it's so funny that I didn't pick it up and, and start reading it right away. I'm like, I don't know why she gave me that book. This book got to do with struggle. And then one day out of boredom, I'm in the cell, and I pick up the book and, and start reading it. And then couldn't put it down. Couldn't put it down because it, it, it gave me for the first time an understanding of love and life and its place in the struggle. You know, and what what kind of society are you in that maybe it's designed to like frustrate that kind of genuine, authentic love? And what's the challenges for you to embrace it, you know? So relations, it gave me a, a sense of how important the relationships are in the struggle. And that they're just not for the political purposes. Therefore, really, your humanity, what is it, your being in the world that helped you to just be, you know, a better person, a loving person, a more creative, even a more playful person. That opened that door for me. It, so that I it just wasn't about being a political activist anymore with that with that particular book. I'll let Carla talk about it, but Carla has this brilliant comment about how it's about relationships now. And so what you just said pivots perfectly into Carla. So I <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot now, but I just oh my goodness. it's perfect. So um well it was funny because I was I was thinking about the leadership stuff because I also really love that the conversation about the role of leaders um and how it can lead to hierarchy really quickly um but yes uh you know the whole like we relationship is what we're all ultimately fighting for and trying to recover because we can trace it early whiteness early colonialism empire whatever name you want to give it yeah was about s destroying our relationships, our social bonds. Um, right. It goes way back. Kropotkin, this is what Kropotkin talked about. You know, Sylvia Federici, the whole witch hunts was 100% about sowing distrust in our relationships and yes. breaking apart communities. So it's like, that's what we have to recover. And I think we lose sight of that. We There's something in there, right? Um, so I, I'm loving what I'm hearing from you because even your, I, I don't think I've ever heard this story about the splinters and the Black Panther. Um, uh, that's my, probably my own ignorance of not coming across it in books and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I would really like to hear more about like how leadership, the nuance of leadership, because I, you know, I always say that our family is leaderful because I don't, I don't think we can, I don't think the goal is to go completely flat because hierarchy gets in there anyway. So I'm just, yeah, if you could maybe speak a bit more about your thoughts on how does leadership play a role and why is charismatic leadership such a problem maybe? <laughs> Not to put words in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, like, like you, it's not so much, I think it's even just a misunderstanding with anarchism. It's not like anarchism is against leadership, maybe what kinds, What's the understanding? And and um, maybe we're talking about if there's leaders, do they understand that their their role is really temporary and that it should be shared, that responsibility should be shared, that you should never get in a situation that more and more starts to fall on you, even when you see that people are putting more and more on you. You know, there's an example of, of, of uh, what I learned in, about the civil rights movement with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. There was this, um, one of their leaders was named Bob Moses. Um, he, and he was very, I think he was very charismatic as it goes, but I think he was also really a great organizer, real people person. 
But he found that people started to put more on him to do, to think, to do all of this stuff instead of what he wanted was them to take their own responsibilities and develop their own capacities. And at a certain point, he saw that even his last name, Moses, they were starting to like, saw Moses. And he was like, no, no, I'm not your Moses. And stop referring to me as your Moses. And, and it gave me an example, like the, those people even within uh, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and Ella Baker, you know, who were those who was like, take those roles on yourself as a collective and stop, you know, dealing with the charismatic leaders like, as we know, Martin Luther King and those like him, because there's some dangers with that, you know? It, it, and it's been hard, I think, with people of African descent because we've had so many, a long line of charismatic leaders. And so it seems like it's hard to break that tradition. Though, I do think one of the things I'm seeing about the new movements today, probably uh, seeing it more 2019 with a lot of the protests and the demos in the streets leading up to 2020, that there was this, and I had to look it up, um, respectability politics, all right? Respect, and, and it's like this, this generation now, and it seems like there was this battle against respectability politics where just because, you know, I'm this person with the suit and tie and I got these PhDs, uh, or I, I was a former prosecutor here and now I'm a politician, this generation was like, don't care change has to happen, and new terminology started to come in uh, about the police from the dismantling to the defunding, which I may have some problems with the defunding, but I love the dismantling. But it was just that more and more of them was not willing to accept these, um, uh, these so-called people put up as leaders who are telling them to, you gotta vote, you gotta respect, you know, authority, you got to be careful about what you do, you got to respect. And they're like, mm mm. And I saw it more like this television that you see, but I'm not much of a Facebook person. But then I started getting on to my Facebook and, and I see the same conversations going on in Facebook that a lot of people understand that just because uh, Al Sharpton says something, you know, or they pull out one of Martin Luther King's children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, that that makes their voice the authority and you're supposed to just automatically leave, you know. Huey Newton wasn't a charismatic person, you know. That was supposed to have been Bobby Seale. But um, I know from back then that you got to deal with a person's practice and, and if it's coming from a principled place, regardless if they're a good speaker or not, you know? Um, so when I see today, I mean, I, I think what I see today is people are not so easy to just accept who the media or who your political appointed, appointed people are that says, listen to me. They look like they more want to listen to each other or to voices that they have not heard before, you know? And I'm real excited about the fact that in the last several years, you hear the voices of women, um, queer, trans, um, former prisoners, voices that you never ever hear from. One of the things about the Black Panther Party that we we prided the capacity of the lumpen proletariat, as we called it in Marxist terms, street folks, folks that have been kicked out of the means of production, no longer useful, that our voices were important. Today, I'm seeing that 
and a new breed of voices out there that you would never have ex expected their voices to become heard. But you got new means of getting them voices out now. You know, one of the good things about social media, not necessarily that I like a lot of social media, you know, but to, to see it now gives me hope that these voices will galvanize other folks in ways that can build new kinds of movements that can survive uh, what's already, you know, have been a, a onslaught of repressive moves, you know. There's a lot going on, you know, and some of it I'm I'm excited about. Some of it just makes me worry. Um, I just keep my eyes open. You're listening to Silver Threads, part of the Grounded Futures multimedia platform. For more information and to donate to our totally ad-free show, check out groundedfutures.com. You can reach out to us with thoughts and suggestions at silverthreadsshow at protonmail.com. You can find out more about our host, Eleanor, via artkillingapathy.com, and our host, Carla, via joyfulthreadsproductions.com. What's up, y'all? I'm Pearson, host of Coffee with Comrades. Coffee with Comrades is rooted in militant joy. Our hope is to cultivate a warm and inviting atmosphere, like walking into your favorite coffee shop to sit down with some of your close friends and share a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. New episodes premiere every Tuesday, so be sure to smash that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast so that you never miss an episode. We are proud to be a part of the Channel Zero Network. And now, back to the show. I, I know we're, we're going to get to the what are you hopeful or not hopeful about in a bit, mm -hmm. but I wanted to wanted to kind of circle back because you mentioned Ella Jo Baker and one of my favorite quotes is by Ella Jo Baker and she said, strong people don't need strong leaders. Yes. And I just love that. <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorites also. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, she's totally uh, awesome and has been, you know, a big part of the political education that our mutual aid group has, uh, has done. And I think, you know, part of the part of the object to, or the goal of this podcast is to say that, you know, strong people who don't need strong leaders still fuck up and get scared and uh, fail and trip over themselves. And um, and that's not only important to highlight, but it's necessary. Like we all do that. So curious if you could share like some moments in your past where you were either you know, unsure of what you were doing, whether it was the right path or, you know, whether you went down a path and you were like, oh, shit, that that was wrong. <laughs> that was just bad. And if you could share a few of those moments. OK, I definitely have one because I put it down in my notes. This is me. I'm, I'm out of prison. Um, I'm certain I didn't search and found some of the anarchist folks is all in New York City. And um so I'm beginning to, I, I continue my readings in, in anarchism, but I want to see more about um, practices. And I come across the one group, Love and Rage, um, which was very helpful for me in terms of my development. But at the time also where uh, some of us, my old comrades, we're working with these other young folks who want to do things in that kind of Panther style. So we became the Black Panther Collective. And uh, one of my comrades had just married this uh, this sister from Chicago, uh, whose name is Kai. Um, and Kai is a feminist. She is a bad feminist. Uh, we happened to go to a conference one time, and I don't know how it ended up that we wasn't sitting together, but she was like on one side of the conference, I was on another. We could see each other. But for me, it was this opportunity, because I'm reading all this feminism, to get up and say, I'm a feminist. Next thing I know, there's a voice way over on the other side that gets up and say, no, you ain't no feminist. Now you can be a pro-feminist. I'm looking, that's Kai. So at this point, I want to like slink down in my chair and like, oh my God, you know, because I never had it like that, you know? And, and it may be part of like the arrogance that comes sometimes when you're learning new things and, you, and you're sure you got it, 
you know, but in this case, I ain't have it. And she called me out on it and then later gave me more on it to make me understand that I can be supportive, but I can't be up here calling myself some feminist. And from that point on, it made me realize that it ain't just about the readings. You got to really interact at the same time that your readings, because then when you can bounce things off of people, you can kind of help your own understandings of some, some things and maybe uh, see sometimes that you may not be kind of clear on one thing, but other thing, you maybe you got your own point about it, you know, but it was from her doing that. And then making me read more uh, about why men should not go around arrogantly taking that title that allowed me to deepen my understanding, not only theoretically, but in my actual relationship with women in the struggle. And then with men in the struggle, because then it would be my responsibility when I hear some man get up and say the same thing I said. I can go to them and say, yo, Jack, <laughs> hold up. So that was like, that was like one of them, uh, um, uh, that was one of them moments. Another one was um, I was working at a, a organization that uh, served the needs of former prisoners, uh, Fortune Society. And there was this uh, woman, a young woman who I had become very close friends with and who I knew, uh, you know, she's lesbian. And we was having a conversation, and I don't know what I even, I don't remember what I said, but I must have said something fucked up about lesbians, queer folks. And she straightened me out right then and there. Again, she assigned me a book <laughs> to read, which was queer theory, right? And I'm like, oh, God. But you know, you know, I think people gotta understand too, like you learn from making mistakes. You learn from sometimes having not the best understandings of something, but when you can interact with people, there's a chance that you can get some help in, in, in getting to a better place. So I, I, I started to read the book, every day go to work on the subway. I've told this story before, but um, different places. But I, it's important because like, I'm on the train. Usually if I'm reading the book, I'm just reading the book. I'm always reading on the train with a, and the book is open and people can see it. But then I realized that with queer theory, I ain't just holding the book up. I'm holding it down so that people can't quite see the title. And after a couple of days, I'm like, what, what am I doing? Read the book like you usually do. Somebody see and ask you a question, ask you a question. You know? So, so it's like even in that sense, the insight, and then what are you going to do with the insight? You know? Allow it to do something for you. Allow it to help you to grow, to get to a better place, to get to a better understanding. Because it's not only going to help you, but it will also... Uh, give you a chance to help others who might need to get there too. So those little actions, the individual actions that you never realize have can have impact on others, you know? So ne never think that you're just you doing something just doesn't matter. Never know. It's important that it matters to you, but you never know. It may have impact on some others who were able to witness that, you know? So that, that, and so that was, that would have been the other thing, but it, it just helps me to grow because it also told me that my sexist practice, my heterosexist sexist practice needed to get better. And, and I mean, even still to this day, sometimes my wife might, and I'd be thinking I'm doing good. It's a constant struggle, <laughs> so. Be ready, be okay with it. This has been generations, hundreds of years, possibly thousands of years of ingrained stuff that now in the course of the struggle, you gotta like, I wanna make steps to getting rid of it. I, I may not ever fully get rid of it, but I need to be in the process. I need to be knowing that on some level, I'm working on it. 
is, is really important, you know? And, and so that's my attitude towards, you know, even when you find that you're in a place that, you know, I don't need to be in this place no more. I need to come out of this. Yeah, here, here. <clears throat> we have a saying in our house because I live with two cis men and one trans man of like, fail at patriarchy. <laughs> Keep failing. You're doing great. <laughs> um, it, you know, I love when you were saying, you know, to go back to the radicalism thing, you were saying when you're looking at something new, you put radicalism in front of it. I do that too. Um, <laughs> but I, we, we like to uh, ask folks, you know, what does, what does radicalism or militancy mean to you, particularly um, thinking geographically, like where you live and maybe how it's evolved and sort of, Trying to uh, unpack that word a bit. Okay. Um, okay. So when I when I uh, um, doing my notes, um, I looked at it first like geographical. All right. If I want a person to understand me, I want them to understand the geographical part about my folks were brought here from Africa, so it might be a, a geographical movement. You know, brought here by in the European slave trade to create colonies that eventually led to the construction of the United States of America. And here is Ashanti. Even when I do my, you know, I, I was doing uh, Ancestry.com. And um, I mean, to tell you, like, the regions they say that you're from in Africa, but it can never, it doesn't pinpoint, I don't say never, at least as far as I know. Um, it can, the region that you come from in Africa, you know, for me, that's like, oh my God, man. We didn't come here by choice. You know, we came here in slave ships and then these people did this to us for several centuries. And then it, their empire just, transformed into different ways, but kept the relationship, you know, so it kind of camouflaged the relationship, but we're still on the bottom, you know? And, and so if you want to understand me, I, I want you to understand how our people got here, you know, and what this Turtle Island became. Um, then I want people to understand, making it personal, me, being born in the uh, 50s, coming up through the civil rights movement to the black power movement, that it made me this person that um, always takes into that, in, into my being the kidnapping and the treatment here and why it made sense for me to become a black nationalist, why it made sense for me to get into the revolutionary politics of the Black Panther Party, why it made me that person to come into an understanding of anarchisms, the anarchisms to realize that, you know, um, if I want or if our people want to deal with being free within the confines of this empire, that you gotta deal with the what I've read to, in, in certain theological writings, the two original sins of America, the kidnapping, kidnapping of African people and the genocide against First Nations. You know, so I am who I am, my radicalism or my militancy because of those foundational factors. And so if you really want to understand me, those things are important because I want to deal with it there. Because I feel like if you don't deal with it there, you, you get caught up into trying to improve the empire. You want to figure out the way to make it wait, work for you. No, no, let's let's you know there's still First Nations folks, and and um and we got to go to them and African folks. I mean we're all mixed up in this empire, but still deep down want to be free from it and don't quite know how to do it. And sometimes the dominant voices is those voices that are so beholden to empire that you'll never hear them tell you the truth if they know it, or they will never uh, want to uh, remove themselves from the privileges that they get. 
you know, these bougie leaders, these, um, for example, if you look at all these people that are supporting Biden, that are from the, those are becoming part of his cabinet that are people of African descent, so many, like Kamala Harris, got these prosecutorial backgrounds or judges and all this other, and you see the reporters on MSNBC and, and, and CNN, and it's like when they want to get uh, somebody to comment on something, it's some Black person that's been a prosecutor or former judge or they've been to law school. Like, those are the voices that you get. And then here comes, you know, they done dragged out one of Martin Luther King's family members or Sharpton. But no one wants to deal with, we got to change this thing here. I haven't, and I have not saw anyone present a vision of something different other than the anarchists. And one, it, like in particular, there was, I don't know, the, the newspaper or the magazine or the zine, which my daughter is learning how to do zines in school. Uh, but there was the picture, there was this picture of the United States. And instead of the states, there was just thousands of circles that represented different peoples and stuff. And so the whole thing about it was that you got to be able to reimagine this landmass that we know of as the United States Empire, having thousands and thousands of autonomous things going on, you know, regardless of what the borders and stuff, you know, and what might that really, how might we really get there, but always privileging the voices of those most impacted. And I hate it when it's just left there. But uh, First Nations folks, African folks, Mexicans, you, you stole their land. You know, how did you get to Hawaii? How did you get to Alaska? Look at what you're doing to Puerto Rico. And when we can come together and like one of them people, revolutionary people's conventions, like in the days of the Black Panther Party, we need to be able to sit down and put our imaginations together to be able to see something different that honors those who were here first, that, that honors those who suffered from years, uh, hundreds of years of slavery, the theft of land, you know, 